Hi everyone, Dave here at East Rosebud Fly and Tackle in Billings, Montana. Today I'm going to show you a couple of very, very special caddis pupa patterns that were developed by the late Gary LaFontaine. Gary lived in Red Lodge, did a lot of fishing in the Clark's Park area, also on the Big Hole. And he spent about, he and his helper spent about 10 years studying caddis flies. They literally laid on their back in scuba gear on the bottom of a stream bed and watched how fish took naturals and also how they took the artificials that they tied and tried. Uh, they tested every element separately. Now before Gary's work, caddis flies were pretty much ignored by fishermen because we didn't understand them. We didn't even know which adult matched which larva. And so again, except for occasional dry fly, people didn't really fish for them. What Gary discovered is that um, some very unique things about the caddis pupa. Now the caddis has a, a complete life cycle, unlike a mayfly. So they have egg, larva, the pupa, and the adult stage. During the pupal stage, where the uh, caddis fly seals itself off in its little cocoon, and that's where it goes from a larva to a complete adult. What happens is under the larval skin, the adult is forming legs, wings, everything is forming underneath the skin. So when the pupa emerges from the case and comes towards the surface, there is a couple of things that really the trout really key in on. One of them is the shape of the pupa. Now remember you have this larval skin, which is simulated by this antron shuck. Underneath is the body of the fly. Also trapped within this larval skin are air bubbles that the fly generates to help it ascend to the surface and also to help break through that larval skin. Remember water is about 700 times more dense than air so as this fly approaches the surface those bubbles expand and help break out of that, um, that larval skin. And they actually found that this was the most preyed on a life form of the caddis as that caddis is coming towards the surface. The only thing that's sticking out of that larval skin are the hind legs which are very heavily fringed and the caddises are just swimming like crazy to get to the surface assisted by that little air bubble. And the air bubble was extremely prominent in these caddis flies that he found it was a real trigger to these fish. Gary is the one who actually brought Antron um, Crestlon is another trade name, same material. He actually picked some fibers out of his carpet to try to get this translucent sheath which would also trap air bubbles in it. So we owe it to Gary for discovering Antron for us, which we use now in so many things it's hard to believe. Gary wrote the book on caddis flies, literally. The book is called Caddis Flies. It was published in 1981. And if you want to know everything there is to know about caddis flies and how to tie them, this is the book to have. Now with the Sparkle Pupa series, which this is, there is a deep sparkle pupa. The uh, shank is weighted with lead wire and um, you have some hen hackle fibers to simulate the wings and a little bit of ostrich hurl. The, uh, emergent sparkle pupa which is very much the same except that it's not weighted and instead of having hen hackle fibers there's a little bit of deer hair here to help buoy this flow up this fly up right below the surface film there's also a few strands of antron here trailing behind it now the one thing that i see most often in sparkle pupas that are tied is that they use too much of the shuck material remember this is supposed to be translucent. It's also supposed to trap air bubbles. If the shuck becomes too dense, you can't see, the fish can't see the fly underneath it, and it doesn't trap the air bubbles. So what I'm using for our shuck here is Sparkle Emerger yarn, and I'm using just one strand. This fly has just one strand to envelop the entire shank. This fly has two strands, which I think is bordering on excessive. Now this is a size 12 fly and you can get away with that, but as you get towards the smaller flies and you can tie these all the way down to size 20, you want to be very careful that you don't overdo the shuck material. Gary lists about four primary color combinations that will 
cover about 90% of the caddisflies we hear and have in the West. And he has another 14 or 15 variations on that for other patterns. So there's a lot of combinations that you can use. I'm going to do basically the rockworm, the Rhynchophilia, which is a free living caddis, very, very common on our local streams, and they hatch all summer long. Okay, enough of the background. I'm going to start with a size 14, number 419 fire hole stick. I like it because it's got a nice wide gap on it, and it's barbless. I'm using 80 uh, Vivas fluorescent green thread because I'm using a very shiny um, case on this. I want to start the thread a couple of eye lengths behind the eye and wrap a thread base all the way to the end of the shank. Now you'll see in many many books and videos where they recommend tying a hank of sparkly merger yarn on one side and another hank on the other side or one top and one bottom. To me that's a very very easy way to build up too much material on this on this fly. I'm simply going to use one strand and we're going to use a distribution wrap to help fold this material around the hook shank. So we simply get our ends trimmed up fairly even here and I'm going to make, and don't worry about your butt ends sticking out, this is going to be covered with dubbing. I'm simply going to make two soft wraps and I'm going to use the thread tension itself to distribute this material around the hook shank. Don't worry if it's not 360 degrees. As long as there's enough of a, a bubble around these flies, it works just fine. So use your fingernails, use your thread wraps, and just kind of position this material to envelop the hook shank. And then wrap over the butts coming forward. Now for the underbody, I'm just using some hair tron dubbing. This is just rabbit fur with a little bit of antron in it. You don't need to dub it very heavily just enough to give the appearance of an actual fly underneath that bubble sheath. As you can see, I've, although I'm going to dub from the butt of the, of the sheath forward, I've left my thread a little short of that. The reason being, it's very, very difficult to dub tightly right up against the hook shank. So instead of wasting bare thread wraps at my dubbing point, this way I'm going to use up my bare thread wraps as I work forward so that my dubbing starts where I want it to, right at the tail. Again, we're going to build a fairly thin body coming forward. And we're going to stop two eye lengths shy of the eye. This will give us room to tie off the shuck itself and also to tie in the winging material. Okay, and then we'll bring our thread forward to build a thread base and bring it right back to the front of the abdomen. All right, now as you bring this material over, a couple of points here. Try to keep the fibers parallel with the hook shank and just use your fingers to kind of distribute it around the hook like so. Push it back towards the back a little bit to form this little bit of bubble. Take two soft thread wraps I try not to uh, twist this material. Once you've got that wrap down, you can simply use your bodkin and pull some of these fibers out a little bit, or if they're too long, you can pull them back in. The idea here is just a sparse bubble. Distribute this just a little bit better. And you can play with this all day, but it's really not that important. You just want to make sure that you have adequate material without it being too dense.
I'm going to spin the thread here, tighten it up, cord it up a little bit, make a second wrap tight, and lastly a third wrap. And we'll cut the material off flush, and then with Gary's pattern he cuts a couple of fibers here so that they trail out behind the fly itself. All right. Now for the wing, again this wing helps to keep this caddis up in the surface film where you want it. We're just going to use a very small amount. You can use deer hair or elk hair. This takes a little bit and as usual clean it and stack the tips. This is not a difficult fly to tie. It's extremely effective all summer long. You can use this as a second fly off of your nymph. You can use this as a second fly, a hopper dropper off of your dry fly. And as he found, the trout take the emergers at least 10 to 1 over the actual dry fly. Caddises, once they reach the surface, emerge very quickly. And a trout learns not to waste energy chasing a fly that could disappear at any second. The emerger is extremely vulnerable, and that's what they go after. So we want our wing over the top and just about to the end of the hook shank. Again, we want to keep this sparse. Three tight wraps. We want to still leave room at the head for a little bit of ostrich. Cut that off at a taper and wrap those butts down. Make a nice smooth thread base here so that the ostrich wraps nice. I'm just using brown ostrich here. Just a single hurl. Now if you look at an ostrich hurl, it's very much like peacock in that the barbs don't grow all the way around the shank or the, the quill. The back of the quill is bare of barbs. It's a Y-shaped and cross-section. The barbs actually come off the front of the quill. So when you tie it in, I like to make sure that, tie it in by the tip here. We want to wrap it so that each wrap covers up the bare back of the barb with every wrap. So we want to tie this in with the actual barbs, the hurls, facing up. Wrap that in behind the hook eye. Clip off this excess here. So when we wrap it, the barbs are facing backwards so that each wrap covers up that naked barb from the previous wrap. We only need a couple of wraps. You could also use dubbing for this if you don't want to use ostrich. A couple of wraps to tie it down. And clip that off. If you're a book collector like me, I can't emphasize strongly enough how important Gary's book is and how much you'll learn about caddis flies and the fish's response to them and the different patterns. He also has a diving caddis and a couple of other patterns that he found to be very effective. So there you go. There's the emergent sparkle pupa. It's an easy fly to tie. It's a great fly to have with you on the stream. Thanks for joining in. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please let us know. We'll see you next time.